Okay, so we are going to be going over note 13 from CS70. This one is an introduction to discrete probability. Okay, so the first topic is just about random experience or experiments. So the general idea is that we want to pick some subset K from a set S where the set S has a size of N. And we kind of talked about how to do this in note 10. Um, we kind of looked at the different ways that this works when we want to replace something when we don't want to replace something and we, when we want to keep track of the order when we don't want to keep track of the order so we're just going to use this example of tossing a coin to illustrate some of these other terms so our sample is of size 2 we can either have heads or tails and we're going to want to choose from our set four times so in this case we're doing it with replacement. So a single outcome from the experiment is called a sample point and it's represented as this which is an omega I believe I think lowercase omega and this uppercase omega is the sample space or is it's not really the size it is it's all possible outputs right I mean the cardinality of the sample space would be the size of all possible outputs obviously but just some terms to keep in mind for when we move on to probability spaces so let's see we have two terms that we want to make sure we have a grasp on so one is non-negativity which basically just means that when we talk about the probability of some something a sample point is what it's called any sample point must lie between 0 and 1 and that's because of this rule called total one where that was next thing the sum of all possible sample points should add up to 1 okay and so if we want to put this into yeah well i think we'll look at this example above in a little bit but there's another thing called uniform probability which states that each sample point has the same probability and basically that would mean that you would have one over n you would have a one over n chance of choosing any particular sample point where n is the size of the sample space hopefully that makes sense um, yeah and just comparing to that any of these four or any of these four these length four coin toss combinations should have the same chance for dealing with a, a fair coin. And there's another thing called an event, uh, which is usually represented as that uppercase A. And what it comes down to is a subset of the sample space. And the way that we get that subset is by having some certain condition. And so one event that we could have given this sample space is that we want to find all of the outcomes that have exactly two heads in them. And as we can see, this is a proper subset of the entire sample size up here. Let me make sure, yeah. Okay, so exactly two heads, right? So what is the probability of the event? It's essentially just the sum of the probabilities of each sample point within the event, right? So how do we calculate this probability? So again, all outcomes with exactly two heads, that's just going to be the size of our sub our event. And if we have a output of size four, and we want to choose outputs such that two, like the, the subsets, there's, there's two heads, right? We would just do four, choose two. I mean, this would apply to tails too. Um, and we'll see that that's six, right? And all we have to do is multiply um, the probability of each individual event by the number of events there are. And because we have a uniform distribution, we can just do that like so. Um, otherwise, at least in this scenario, if there were different probabilities for each particular length for coin toss string, 
then we would have to multiply those separately. But again, because it's a uniform probability, we can just multiply it by the number of sample points that there are. So in this case, it comes out to a 3 8 chance that um, you get an outcome with two heads. Okay, so we're just going to look at some more examples here. Um, coin tosses again. We're going to sort of generalize how this works. So, you know, we're used to thinking of coin tosses as being 50% chance head, 50% chance tail, but we can also generalize it to differing probabilities of the coin landing on heads or on tails. So we can just establish the probability of it landing on heads as P, and that means that the probability of the coin landing on tails would have to be one minus P. And this looks a little weird. I think it should be, um, should still be the probability of P like this, yeah. So let's consider the case in which the probability of landing on a head is two thirds. Okay, so um, we want to answer the same question that we had before, which is just stating that given our sample space includes all possible combinations of four coin tosses, what is the probability that we get two heads in a row? Um, right, I, I'm not sure if I explicitly explain this, but it's basically like these, I, I think it's fairly obvious, but like one of these strings of letters represents the outcome for tossing it for that many times, right? So there's four letters. So the first time we get a heads, the second time we get a heads, third time we get a heads, just, yeah. I think that's fairly clear. So we wanna answer the same question that we get two, two heads in a row. So a subset with two heads, um, it doesn't necessarily have to be in a row as we saw here. So it should just be two heads. And we know that every string of length four that has two heads must have two tails. And so in this case, we are allowed to multiply the probabilities of each individual sample point. Um, in other cases, it's not necessarily the case. But for here, we have two heads, so we can multiply the probability of getting one head by the probability of getting another head. And then we have two tails because we have a length four string. And then again, because the probability of getting heads is two thirds, that must mean that the probability of getting a tails is one minus two thirds or one third. Okay. And then if we want to determine the probability of this event, all we have to do is multiply all the subsets with two heads times the probability of each sample point in that subset. And we get eight over 27. Okay, so now we're going to generalize this a little bit. So, you know, as we stated above, probability of getting heads is P. Naturally, the probability of getting tails is one minus P. Okay, and then from there, we can, if we want to determine the probability of a certain sample point, we can use this expression. And we'll just sort of define what some of these terms mean. So again, P is the probability of heads, one minus P is the probability of tails, R is the number of heads, and N is the number of tosses. So if we look at this example, we have a string of length four, so N is equal to four. We have two heads, and the head has a probability of two thirds, and therefore we have a probability of getting a tail as one minus two over three, which is one over three. And then we raise that to the number of tosses minus the number of heads, which is two. So this formula fits this expression. And this essentially just generalizes this probability of the entire event. The probability of R H's um, would be this expression right here. Okay, so that's that. Let's move on to rolling dice. This one is pretty straightforward actually. So all we really have to do is take the number of sample points in our event and divide it by the number of sample points in our entire sample space. So if you wanted to determine the probability that the sum of 
rolling two dies is equal to 10. So say if we have two dies, um, we could, you know, we could roll four and six. Um, what else can we do? Five and five, uh, six and four. It turns out that there's six possibilities and we just divide it by the number of possibilities in our sample size. Um, there's six sides on a die. So for each side, we can have six more sides because we're rolling two dies. And we basically have a one sixth chance of rolling two dies that sum up to 10. Okay, so that's rolling dice. I would just probably remember that equation. And then card shuffling, they kind of threw this one in here. I think it sort of relates to the poker hands, but the sample size is 52 factorial. We went over this in the first um, probability note, I guess, is that considered probability? I, I guess, yeah, yes, yes. And we also assume that the probability space for choosing cards is uniform. Um, in practice, that's not the case, but as they said in the notes, for our purposes, it's good enough. A poker hand is a set of five cards from a deck of 52. We, again, we sort of talked about this in note 10. I think it was note 10, yeah. So the size of our sample size of poker hands is going to be 52 choose five, which turns out to this many possibilities. And let's say we have some event A, and this event is going to be the probability that a hand is a flush, so that all cards are of the same suite. So again, we're gonna assume that we are dealing with a uniform probability space, and we can think that there are four suites, and there are 13 cards per suite, and so we want to choose five from that set of 13 cards. And then we want to do that four times because there's four suites. And then here is essentially the algebra. And as we can see, it's a pretty low chance that the hand is a flush, okay? Next, we're going to talk about balls and bins and it's going to be in a slightly looser sense than what we talked about in note 10. So we sort of start out with this example where we have 20 labeled balls and 10 labeled bins. So we're going to put this in terms of S, K, and N. So S is our set. It kind of represents like what our elements actually are. So we have those 10 bins and then we have K is equal to 20. And in this case, we are sampling with replacement um, and order also matters because the balls are labeled. Okay, so um, we can sort of generalize this to if we have m balls and n bins, then there's n to the m possibilities. Right, so for each bin, we can put m different balls into one bin, right? And then again, I said for each, but I guess for bin one, you can put m balls. For bin two, you could put m balls. So naturally, for all n bins, the total number of possibilities is n to the m. Or just, I guess, the total number of possibilities for this setup is that. Hopefully, I, hopefully I'm not overcomplicating. Just read what I wrote, to be honest. Okay, now we're going to say, let a be the event that bin one is empty. So this is sort of similar to the dice rolling uh, formula in that we have the size of our event and then we have the size of our sample size and then we just divide event size by sample size to get our probability and if it's the case that one bin is empty then that means we only have nine bins to choose from right so we disperse 20 balls among those nine bins and this is the probability that we achieve that Okay, and um, yeah, probability that one bin is empty. This takes the same form as that, and then it's just, just an algebraic manipulation of the first equation. Okay, we're gonna look at another example. Let event B be the event that bin one contains at least one ball. Okay, so let's see what this looks like. So this is sort of the inverse, or I guess converse, of the above statement. So 
be the event that bin one contains at least one ball. Yeah, that's pretty much all there is for that. Um, for flipping coins, okay, so this is still in the context of balls and bins. Balls and bins, I think what they're trying to show is that it's sort of versatile, or at least this implementation of it is, because we can represent coin tosses by having these two bins, heads or tails, and then if we want to make three coin tosses, or perform three coin tosses, we can just put them in either of the two bins, head bin or a tail bin. And we can do the same thing with rolling dice. There's six possibilities, and we have the option to choose one of those possibilities twice when we roll the dice. Okay, now we're going to talk about something called the birthday paradox. And I think this is just something that's sort of interesting that they wanted to share. And what it is, is the probability that two people share the same birthday. So we're going to let n be the number of people, and we're going to let our set s be the numbers 1 through 365 to represent each of the days of the year. And as we can see, the size of our sample size is 365 to the number of people. Because each person could potentially have any possible birthday, right, in the range 1 through 365. And we are going to create this converse event which is instead of the probabil probability that two people share the same birthday, it's the probability that no two people share the same birthday. And we're basically going to use the first rule of counting. Um, yeah, basically replacement. Uh, re there is no replacement in the first rule of counting and order matters. So what I mean by that is if we want to ensure that no two people have the same birthday, we're going to do kind of what we did with um, enumerating the number of choices of pulling a card from a deck, right? In the first case, the first person can have any one of 365 days as their birthday. Then in the second case, once the first person has been given their birthday, we want to ensure that the second case does not have that birthday. So then we have one out of, we have 364 days to choose for that second person third person has 363 and so on. And we can use this image to sort of illustrate that. So again, probability of the event over the probability of the sample size. Um, and I think I'm calling it, yeah, sample size. Sample point sample size. Sample space, is that what? Uh, let me double check. Sample space, when I say sample size, I mean sample space. So, yeah, this is essentially just the algebra algebra for it, and we can see just some of the statistics right here. I think the reason why they called it a paradox is not because it's like an actual paradox, just because it's it's unintuitive, I guess. So it's like if you have 23 people, then there's a greater than 50% chance that two of them share the same birthday, and if you have 60, it's almost guaranteed. Um, but yeah, okay, so. We're going to move on to the last example, and this one is the Monty Hall problem. This one is pretty cool, actually. So it took me a little bit to understand this, but I think understanding the story the right way the first time around is important. So you are a contestant on a game show, and you have the option to pick one door, and there are three doors and behind one of those doors is a prize. But behind the other two are goats, I guess. That's just what they did. So the way it works is that you pick one door, but you don't open it right away. And someone on the, sh on the show opens a door with a goat behind it. And you have the option to switch. And so what we want to determine is if it is more beneficial for you to switch or for you to stay. So let's take just a quick look at this. So if you pick this door, then naturally there's a one third chance that the prize is behind it. And that means that there's a two thirds chance that there is a, 
prize behind the other two doors. And we're assuming that there is a uniform um, probability for each sample point. Okay, and um, yeah. So let's just look at what we have. So sample points are going to take this form and i, j, and k represent three different things. So i is going to be the location of the prize where it actually is. So if we think about it, there's three possibilities, right? It could be behind any door. j is the number of choices that you can make, you the contestant. So again, you can pick from any one of three. And then k is the number of, cho of doors that Carol can pick, the person on the show. So the reason why it's two and not three is because it's guaranteed that Carol will open a door with a goat behind it. Okay, so um, this actually brings us to two cases, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But again, if there are two doors that have that each have goats behind them, then no matter what door you pick, Carol will always be able to open a door that has a goat behind it. Okay, and just some assumptions we're going to make. So the prize is equally likely to be behind any door and the contestant is equally likely to pick any door, right? Okay, so let's look at the two sets of possibilities. Maybe I should have hidden this, but so, right. So I is equal to J, what is that? Or I is not equal to J. So I is equal to the actual location of the prize. So one of the cases is that the door that you pick is not the door that is in front of the prize. So this is just one example. The prize is behind door two. You pick door one. So then Carol picks door three. Okay, so um, one third chance of the prize being behind any of the doors, one third chance of you randomly picking a door. But then there is a, there is a, just a one chance, 100% um, chance that, of the door that Carol picks. And why is that the case? Well, if you pick a door that isn't where the prize is, that means that it's behind, or it is in front of a goat. And because Carol has to open a door that has a goat behind it, the only option she has is to open the other door with a goat behind it. Because she can't pick your door, because the whole point of this game is, you know, do you want to stay on your door or do you want to switch? So, yeah. And if we think about it, there's six possibilities of this. So, you know, it's kind of like two for every spot. So if the prize is behind door one, then your choice such that you don't pick the door in front of the prize is that you have to pick door two or three because the prize is behind door one. If you pick door two, then that means you must pick door one or three. So it's six possibilities. And then again, because there is three, um, what is this? Yeah, I think, did I do this right? Um, this might be, so actually this is not, this is not always true. It's not always two, it's sometimes one. So actually ignore what I said about this. I mean, as we just saw, sometimes it's it's a 100% chance the door that she picks. It depends on the context. So the other case is that the door that you pick is the door that has a prize behind it. And if you pick the door that has the prize behind it, that means that Carol has two doors from which she can choose a goat, right? So if we multiply the probabilities out, one third chance of the, of the location of the prize, one third chance of you just picking that door. And then now Carol can choose either one of two doors. So this is the overall probability for that event. And, you know, if we basically just multiply these, the number of possibilities by each event, we will find out that it does sum up to one. Okay, so we want to again know if it's more beneficial to switch or to stay. So these are the two cases, right? Either you land 
on the door with the trophy behind it, or you don't land on the trophy on the door with the trophy behind it. But just from this, you can see that it is much more likely that you land on the door that doesn't have the trophy on it. It's twice as likely, um, actually. Um, or actually, let's take a look at this. So let's before we get ahead of ourselves, if we want to determine the probability of switching doors in order to get a win, it must mean that we are not behind the door or we, we have not chosen the door that has the trophy behind it. So the probability of, you know, us switching and us winning is this case, which is a probability of two over three, which is much greater than the other probability, which is one over three. So switching greatly increases your chances, as you can see. Hopefully that makes a bit more sense. Um, if not, I will just stare at these two right here. But um, other than that, we're going to move on to the next part, which is just the summary. So something they want to stress is that the systematic approach to these types of problems is much better than the intuitive approach because if you just look at something and you get like a feeling that this is kind of what it fits with, you might fall into some traps you might deceive you might be deceived so just order of operations first off what is the sample space what are all the possible outcomes what is the probability of each sample point you know is it is it a uniform probability does each sample point have a different probability what event are we interested in you know what condition are we looking for and what subset of the sample space is that going to give us? And let's calculate the probability the probability of the event you know, in relationship to our sample size, which is just taking the sum of the elements of the event, dividing it by the sample, the, the size of the sample space. Size of the sample space. So again, the intuitive approach can sometimes lead to pitfalls. So go with this systematic approach. All right, so that has been note 13 for CS70. This has been an introduction to discrete probability.